from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good morning. My name is Jason Steinhauer, and I'm a program specialist at the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. The Kluge Center brings some of the world's top scholars to the library to conduct research in the library's collections and shares their research with policymakers and the public. This year is our 15th anniversary. We were founded in 2000 through a generous gift by philanthropist John W. Kluge. And to date, we've welcomed more than 600 scholars who have used the library's unparalleled collections and resources to research their books, articles, or other projects. Today, we are delighted to be a part of this year's National Book Festival and to showcase a very small sample of the scholarly work conducted by the center's resident scholars in the fields of sociology, politics, and history. And as a reminder, this program is being filmed and recorded for future broadcasts on the library's website and YouTube channels. Our first speaker is scholar Manuel Castells. Dr. Castells is a world-renowned sociologist. He is the recipient of numerous prizes and has been knighted by the governments of France, Finland, Chile, Portugal, and Catalonia. He is one of the world's leading thinkers on the information age and networked societies. His book, Networks of Outrage and Hope, Social Movements in the Internet Age, was partially written at the Kluge Center in 2012 when Dr. Castells held the Kluge Chair in Technology and Society. And Dr. Castells is also a member of the Library of Congress Scholars Council. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Manuel Castells. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks to all of you for your interest. Um, the book that I am presenting to you, Networks of Outrage and Hope, uh, studies the new forms of social movements empowered by internet and wireless communication that have exploded all over the world in, the, in recent years. Um, it is significant in my view, this topic, because social movements throughout history are, have been and are the levers of social change. Uh, they form outside the institutions, they form outside the established politics, and uh, they transform these politics and these institutions if they succeed, and still they leave a mark, even if they don't seize power, in the minds of the people, which is the fundamental role of social movements. The social movements that my book covers uh, were those that started fundamentally, let's say, in the mid-2000s, uh, 2004, 2005, and accelerated in, um, uh, from 2010 onwards, and rapidly extended all over the world through an element that was not planned, was not plot, was a diffusion of the ideas and forms of these movements. I would actually insist in the importance of the uh, movement in Tehran in 2009 with effects, delayed effects down the line, um, the movement in uh, Tunisia and uh, Iceland in 2010, the Arab Spring in 2011, the Spanish indignant movements uh, in uh, 2011, and from there Occupy Wall Street in the United States, which even if uh, some media have tried to hide it, actually led to occupation of over 1,000 cities in the United States in terms of public space for several months. I'll say something in a moment about uh, the, the, what happened in terms of the uh, lasting impact. And then went on, went on in places like Brazil in the last three years, every year has been major social movements uh, in Turkey, in Chile, uh, and, and also lately uh, in Hong Kong, uh, the Umbrella Revolution in Hong Kong in last year. And I can name uh, endless uh, of these of this movements. So I cover uh, many of them um, through participant observation, ethnography, and uh, also uh, reports directly from the movement through my uh, global network of connection with activists uh, around the world. 
And what is interesting is that in all these very different contexts, there were a tremendous diversity of demands, but one word that was common to all of them without any previous agreement, dignity. These are movements for dignity, to defend what people feel as a humiliation from life in general, but more particularly from the political elites and the, from the financial elites. These are, these are the key elements. Um, the, in different contexts, as I will summarize in a second, there had been very similar forms of movement. Now, if in democracy and dictatorship, in economic growth and economic crisis, in many different cultures, there are similar forms of movements, it means that there is some common pattern and that these movements are the social movements corresponding to our kind of society, the network society, and to our age, the information age. So this is what I have been trying to present and to investigate. Um, which are the common elements, the similar elements that form actually a new pattern of social movements? They are largely spontaneous in almost all contexts. They are usually leaderless, although occasionally can be a spokesperson, but not true leaders in the traditional sense. They are not organized in vertical uh, systems of uh, uh, command and control. They usually spark, no, they always spark from outrage, just outrage, that then is transformed into deliberation, is transformed in discussion, transformed in debate. But they start from a spark of outrage outside the institutional system outside the traditional political actors, as well as of unions and traditional forms of organization. They force the media to recognize their existence in spite of the uh, uh, inability of the media at the beginning to report on them. And they are able to exist because of their independent communication capacity, horizontal communication and local global communication uh, on the basis of the internet and uh, wireless social networks. By the way, this is critical of all social movements throughout history. Social movements depend on communication because it's only through communication that ideas can be related to other people and uh, since they are against the institutions, against the logic of the system, they have to build their own bridges among themselves and among themselves and society at large. And that happened through communication. So different forms of communication lead to different forms of social movement and different forms of organizational uh, dynamics. They are fundamentally based on what I call a space of autonomy. They are not uh, triggered by the internet. The, the debate about internet cause or not is, is ridiculous. Of course, no technology starts social movements. But uh, they are started because of outrage, because of the economic conditions, and particularly because of the crisis of political legitimacy in which the institutions of the world are found today. Two-thirds of citizens in the world, including the United States, think that their representatives do not represent them. <laughs> then they have to vote because something has to be done, but they don't believe it. And a uh, large proportion of the American population uh, think that politicians are corrupt uh, by definition. I think it's an exaggeration, but it's important that the large majority of people, it's not important what I think about that, what is important is that what people think, and, and what is important is the uh, increasing cynicism about the political system. Because if in a given society, and in fact in all societies in the world, there is an increasing distance between what people feel and think and the institutions of society, this is a very serious crisis and it starts uh, appearing in different forms, in different manifestations. And key in that sense is the construction by social movements and by the actors of social movements of what I call the space of autonomy. Space of autonomy means a space of communication and visibility that is independent and is self-managed. That's first the internet, certainly. Uh, they all start in the internet first. But they become visible by occupying a space and then later on by proposing institutional changes. Um, so it's a combination of internet networks, urban space, which are both public space, cyber space and urban space, and, that's, and then uh, forays into the institutional space. When they are repressed, for instance, they are evicted from the places they occupy, they still exist. Uh, they still exist in the networks 
of internet and they come back and forth. They are rhizomatic. They are constantly deliberating. They are local and global. And they act on the minds of people, on the individual minds and on the public mind. That is critical. An example. Now, in the public discourse, everybody is talking, conservatives, liberal, everybody, about the 1% and the 99%. Well, that came from the movement. No one was talking about that before, even if we have the same kind of empirical evidence. But then, so what? Which are the outcomes of this movement? The, the perception from politicians, the media, etc. Well, oh yeah, uh, these kids go back, but they pass, uh, we forget. That's not the important thing. What is the actual outcome? Well, their outcomes are both long-term and short-term. In many cases, they extended, they obtained satisfaction uh, to significant demand. For instance, in Israel, the largest mobilization in Israeli history in uh, July 2011, or in Spain, or in Greece. The outcomes are also long-term. But more important, when people say they have no political effect, they do have political effect, tremendous political effect, largely because they, they start with a critique of the democratic forms of representation. They have shattered and transformed political systems, entire political systems, even if we think their effects are negative. The Arab revolutions for geopolitical intervention ended up in pain from when they went from the spring to the winter. But effects, they didn't have effects. They transformed the Arab landscape. Then we, we may say, we don't like it, but transformative effects, they, they did have. Uh, they had had dramatic delayed impact on elections in Iran. I can trace personally the election of Rouhani with the Iran nuclear deal, etc., 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 to the movements in 2009 that were repressed by left uh, Marx in mind of the young population, which is 70% of the population of Iran. In Italy, in Brazil, in Turkey. In some cases, they have transformed the entire political system with consequences for the whole Europe. Syriza in Greece. Uh, and the opposition to the austerity politics came from the, from the movement, and now it's in the government. Um, most interesting, in fact, and not because originally it came from Spain, uh, the rise of a new party, Podemos, that came from the movement in Spain and started in January 2014, and in one year became number one party, in one year, in terms of the voting intention. Now, went down. Uh, relatively, but has broken the bipartisan hegemony that existed in Spain, and the next elections in December uh, will completely change the political landscape of Spain, as it was already changed in May, in which all the major cities of Spain, all, starting with Madrid, Barcelona, etc., etc., had now, are now governed by a coalition of forces led by Podemos who, that came from the movement in one single shot. So it takes time, it takes four years, five years. Um, so in the US, things are more complex because of the complexity of this country and the, um, and this, and the political system. But uh, my contacts tell me that many of the new acti the activists of the new movement, for instance, Black Lives Matter, are related to the activists of Occupy. In many local mobilizations, the, the occupied veterans, veterans for three years or four years, uh, are there. So the seeds are planted. The seeds are planted. Long term, they are calling for reinventing democracy. That's the key thing of all this movement. We do not have real political representation, taxation without representation. Uh, so they want a new form of democracy that they are trying to imagine. Utopian? Yes and no. U Utopia is not an impossibility. It's a mental force in the minds of the people. When the women movement and the gay movement in search in the 1960s and 70s against patriarchal institutions, they were deemed utopian. Yet today, many of their demands and dreams have become mainstream and receive political respect because they represent a substantial part of the electorate. So in fact, we know that the dreams of today may become the politics of tomorrow. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Morton Kondracki. 
Morten Kondracki is a well-recognized face of journalism for a generation. He's a senior editor and columnist at Roll Call and author of the best-selling best -selling Saving Millie. His book, Jack Kemp, The Bleeding Heart Conservative Who Changed America, was written and researched at the Kluge Center over the course of three years as a Kemp Chair and Distinguished Visiting Scholar, drawing on the library's Jack Kemp papers. Please welcome Morton Kondracki. Well, thanks to you all for coming. Um, uh, d last night at a, at a dinner, David Rubenstein, who's the, you know, the benefactor of, of the uh, book festival, said that there's a, a special place in heaven for people who come to book festivals on holiday weekends. <laughs> um, there's an extra special place in heaven for people who come to the Kluge Center presentation as opposed to Joseph Ellis or David Ignatius, who's our competition. Um, so I am so grateful to the Library of Congress and the Kluge Center for uh, being my happy home for three academic years and, um, uh, and for the generosity of Dr. Billington and uh, the Jack Kemp Foundation uh, for, my, for my fellowship. And I'm sorry, this is what the book looks like. Uh, I'm sorry it's not out yet. It comes out September 29th. Uh, somewhere around here there's going to be some postcards that you can take with, us, with you and pass out to your friends, I hope, um, to uh, encourage them to, to buy it when they can. So um, Fred Barnes and I wrote this book together uh, partly in hopes that Jack Kemp's example of positive, idealistic, growth-oriented, inclusive, and compassionate conservatism would inspire or maybe embarrass um, present-day politicians of both parties especially 2016 presidential candidates, uh, to improve the way they do their work. Um, I hope we're not too late, um, because uh, the Donald Trump phenomenon is something we did not anticipate. Um, and Donald Trump is currently, of course, dominating the Republican uh, presidential race. And Trump represents the, ex the polar opposite of what Jack Kemp represented in every conceivable way except high energy. Um, Kemp was in favor of immigration reform that included a path to citizenship for illegal immigrants who, uh, who had clean records. Um, he fought always on the level of ideas, not on the level of personalities. He never disparaged an opponent. Um, uh, he never could go negative in a campaign, even when uh, it cost him not to do so. Um, he wanted the Republican Party to once again become the party of Lincoln, um, to be inviting to Latinos and African Americans and, and other minorities. Um, as you may know, he was the, uh, a pro star quarterback for the Buffalo Bills and the San Diego Chargers. Um, and uh, it was said of him that he had showered with more African Americans than most Republicans had ever met. Um, <laughs> Uh, he was the president of the American um, uh, 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 Football League Players Association, a union, um, and he helped to desegregate uh, AFL cities and teams uh, when he was the president. So we also wrote this book because uh, Jack Kemp richly deserves a biography and he never had had one. So the opening line of the book and probably the most uh, controversial line, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get a lot of discussion, if we get a lot of discussion, which I hope we will, is as follows. Jack Kemp was the most influential politician of the 20th century who was not president, certainly the most important Republican. Um, so th the basis of this is that as a young backbench uh, congressman uh, in the mid-1970s, he was the foremost political activate, uh, advocate of supply-side economics, which was a revolution in, in economic thinking in the country, which was dominated by Keynesians. Um, all of you, I'm sure, read Paul Samuelson's uh, economics textbook. If you took an economics course in college, that was pure Keynesian, uh, derived from John Maynard Keynes, who said that it was the responsibility of the government to uh, maintain a, a, a strong economy with spending, when times were, were, uh, were um, bad and uh, with, by pulling back when times were good. Um, it, however, uh, most people don't remember 
what the, the 1970s were like. Uh, it was a miserable decade. It was the era of stagflation. Very high unemployment, 7% 7 very, very high inflation, 13% a year. Um, so uh, the, the Keynesian economists had no idea uh, to, how to explain it, and the presidents of the era had no idea what to do about it. Uh, President Nixon tried wage and price controls. That didn't work. Uh, Gerald Ford tried slogans, um, lick your plate clean, whip inflation now. That didn't work. Uh, Jimmy Carter became president and, and encouraged everybody to turn down their thermostats and, um, and wear cardigan sweaters. Uh, that didn't work. And uh, finally, he uh, threw up his hands and said that nothing could be done, that it was the acquisitiveness of the American people that was responsible for this terrible economic condition. And uh, in his Malay speech, he, he essentially said, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing that the government can do that the American people have got to change their ways. So Kemp, um, over time, convinced Ronald Reagan to adopt his tax plan, um, and Reagan did. And the top tax rate was 70% when Reagan took office. It went down to 50% in 1981, and then down to 28% uh, in, in, in 1986. And all of this set forth two decades of prosperity and growth uh, uh, in the country that lasted uh, almost under, under interruptedly through the, uh, through the Clinton administration. Um, now, America's economic success and Reagan's defense buildup stressed the Soviet Union to the point where uh, it eventually collapsed. Uh, and then democracy prevailed, and, uh, and the uh, Eastern Europe was set free and all over the world, um, people thought that democratic capitalism was the, was the end point of history. It also, uh, re America's morale was restored when, uh, when uh, in 1979, only 18% of the American people thought that, that the country was on the right track. Uh, when Reagan left, left office, 68% of people thought that the country was on the right track. Nowadays, it's 27%. Um, so Reagan deserves the credit. He was the president. Um, but our book is meant to illuminate Kemp's role as the major intellectual and political force um, uh, that, that led up to the success of, of Ronald Reagan. Um, it, we, we, there's also a fascinating human story uh, about Jack Kemp that's, that, we, that we tell. Uh, Jack Kemp was raised as a, as a Christian scientist, and I learned a little bit about Christian science. I mean, he wasn't the kind of Christian scientist who no, never went to a doctor, but he was the kind of Christian scientist who believed uh, that, uh, that uh, bad things were only mental, that if you thought right, you could do anything that you wanted to do. So he was too small to be uh, a pro football quarterback. He decided at the age of five that he wanted to be a, a pro football quarterback and he was cut from five NFL teams in three years, and it looked like he had no career. Uh, his, his mother and his grandmother always said that when one door closes, another always opens. And sure enough, the American Football League was created in 1960, just in time for him to, to, to join, and he became a, 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 a superstar. Um, he's, he won't be in the Football Hall of Fame, but he was a star. Uh, he was, he, all of his time in, in the early days in Congress, he would uh, try to proselytize about supply-side economics. The grandees of Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, wouldn't listen to him, thought he was uh, out of his lane, out of his league, um, and um, uh, he was dismissed by both, by leaders of both parties, but he persisted and he persisted and he persisted and he finally won the party over and won uh, Ronald Reagan over. So it's, it's a fascinating human story as well as a, as a, as a political story. Um, he was not successful as a presidential candidate in 1988. Uh, he was not successful as a vice presidential candidate in 1996. Uh, he wanted to wage a war on poverty during the George H.W. Bush administration when he was housing secretary. Uh, he did not succeed in that. And he wasn't a perfect human being. Um, he was impatient. Um, he, was, he always ran late. Uh, he barked at people. 
uh, although he never held a grudge. He, he, he nonetheless barked at them. He drove like a maniac. Um, he uh, couldn't make a, sp a short speech. Um, he was a quarterback all his life, and that had a downside because he thought he should always call the plays, and uh, he wouldn't listen to advice, and he, uh, and, uh, uh, he wouldn't, he wouldn't uh, do what coaches wanted him to do, political coaches especially. Um, but uh, he has not lost his relevance. Um, he, the country still needs many of the policies that he advocated, tax reform, a strong defense, uh, education reform, a compassionate conservatism that helps poor people get jobs and buy houses and not become dependent on the, uh, on the government, but help themselves to be self-reliant. Uh, it needs a growth economic strategy that will en uh, enable uh, the wages of working people to rise and, in fact, restore the American dream, which I think is in trouble at the moment. So I hope you'll get, uh, get our book and read our book. Um, somewhere around there's going to be some postcards that you can take, take with you. Um, uh, but I think mostly what, what America needs is Kemp's spirit. Um, uh, he said that the purpose of, uh, of politics is not to defeat your opponent, but rather to produce better ideas and better leadership that will attract a majority of the American people. And it was an idealistic kind of, uh, of, of politics that uh, the country sorely needs now. And um, I hope you'll read the book and, and uh, agree with it. And um, as citizens, try to, try to promote that kind of politics and urge the, the politicians of today to uh, improve their act, because um, they certainly need improvement. So thank you very much. Our third and final speaker, <clears throat> excuse me, final speaker is Julia Young. Julia is an assistant professor of history at the Catholic University. She is a scholar of Mexican and Latin American history and the history of Mexican migration to the U.S. She researched and wrote her new book, Mexican Exodus: Immigrants, Exiles, and Refugees of the Cristero War, as a Kluge Fellow at the John W. Kluge Center this past year. Please welcome Julia Young. A man is staggering across the desert under a searing sun. He's hot, he's thirsty, he's hungry, he has no money, and he's lost. He's a migrant from Mexico trying to find his way to California into a better job and better life in Los Angeles. He looks around him and sees nothing. Perhaps he prays to God for deliverance because he's almost at the point of hyperthermia and, and the horrible death that so many others like him have found in that desert between the United States and Mexico. Suddenly, off in the distance, he sees a pickup truck bumping towards him. It's a white pickup truck, kind of beat up, um, coming across the desert, coming closer and closer. It comes to him. It stops. The door opens, and a man gets out. He's tall, he has light skin, blue eyes, and dark hair. And he's wearing jeans and a cowboy hat. And he says to the man in Spanish, my friend, are you thirsty? Are you lost? Do you need help? The migrant is so thankful, yes, please. The man from the pickup truck ha hands him water, some money, and he tells him, you're actually very close to California, and he points the way for him, points out the directions in the desert. He's saved the migrant's life. And so the migrant says to the man, how can I ever repay you? And the man says, my name is Toribio Romo. After you get settled in the United States, when you come back to Mexico, look for me in the town of Santa Ana de Guadalupe in Jalisco. And then he got back in his pickup truck and drove off, and the migrant found his way to California, went to Los Angeles, worked as a gardener for a couple of years, um, was successful enough that after a while he was able to make that return trip back to Mexico, um, to the state of Zacatecas in west central Mexico, right next door to the state of Jalisco. 
Um, he never forgot the man in the desert, and so at the end of this trip, um, he took a detour to the town of Santa Ana de Guadalupe, a tiny little place, really nothing more than a street and some businesses and, and a little church at the top of the hill. He saw a townsperson on the street and said, I'm looking for Toribio Romo. Can you help me find him? And the person said, oh, yeah, go and look in the church at the top of the hill. So he walked up to the little church. He went inside. There was no one inside. He sat down, sort of looked around to get his bearings, and something caught his eye. A black and white picture against the wall and a little altar underneath it. The picture was of the man who had stopped him in the desert, Toribio Romo. He walked over to it. He read the placard underneath the picture, and there it said, Santo Toribio Romo, Saint Toribio Romo, died in 1927 at the hands of the federal government during the Cristero War. Now, this was 1980. The Toribio Romo that had appeared to the man in the desert was an apparition. How had this happened? Why had this happened? And even more strange is that after this initial appearance in 1980, more and more migrants began reporting apparitions of Toribio Romo in the desert. He helped some people cross the Rio Grande or the Rio Bravo as it's known in Mexico. He appeared to other people and helped them in similar ways to the man in the desert. It was even reported that he once appeared next to a migrant on an airplane who was feeling distraught and searching, praying for, for help in her journey. Um, and today he's become the patron saint of undocumented migrants, well, all migrants, but especially undocumented migrants who are feeling lost and hopeless. And if you go to Tijuana, to a religious store, you can buy a scapular or an, a, a little religious image of Toribio, Toribio Romo. You can buy candles that you can light to pray to him. Um, and I've even read that you can buy sneakers with his image on, to, on them that will um, sort of help you as you do that difficult walk across the desert. So this priest from a tiny little town in the middle of West Central Mexico who died in 1927 has somehow become the patron saint for migrants who are crossing the border in the late 20th century and the 21st century. So I'm a historian, so I look to history for answers. And so um, as part of a way to answer this question, I, um, I look at the history of the Cristero War this is a war that's not very well known um, that happened in Mexico between 1926 and 1929 when the Mexican government, which was trying to um, restrict the power of the Catholic Church, which was the single most powerful entity aside from the Mexican government, um, published a series of laws that um, really limited the ability of Catholics to practice their faith in Mexico. This is, this is a little strange for people because Mexico is a country that then was 98% Catholic. It's still, um, I think, 88% Catholic today. Um, and the government released laws that stated that um, religious education was banned, priests and nuns couldn't wear their vestments in public, um, no public religious processions could be held, and if you've ever been to Mexico, you know how important public religious processions are. So a lot of people didn't take well to these laws, especially in this area of West Central Mexico that included Jalisco and Zacatecas, um, the states where the migrant and Toribio Romo were from. And they began taking up arms with their old rifles and machetes. They took to the hills and they became um, guerrilla warriors, really, fighting what they saw as a holy war against the Mexican government. Um, and in that war, they had religious visions. They prayed to the Virgin Mary for help. Um, they, they had religious songs that they would sing. Priests would bless them before they went off to battle. Um, and, uh, and they, they fought under the banner of Christ the King. They often went into battle carrying a banner with either the image of the Virgin of Guadalupe, which I'm sure many of you have seen, or Christ the King. And they, their battle cry was, Viva Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King. And because of that, they became known as Cristeros. So um, the one other element of this war is that there were some priests who actually fought in the war, who actually led troops themselves. Um, but a lot more of them, 
went into hiding. Um, they were unable to practice uh, to, to, to give masses in public, but they would give clandestine masses to the troops or to just um, citizens in their homes. And Toribio Romo was one of these. Um, he was, during uh, 1926 and 1927, he was in hiding, going from house to house and town to town, giving masses when they were illegal and providing people with um, sort of religious comfort at a time that they felt they, they really needed it. Um, and so he and many others, many other priests like him, was eventually found by the federal government and he was shot. And when he was shot and died, he became um, almost instantly venerated as a martyr, as, a, as a, um, someone who had died bearing witness for, for God and for Christ. And so very soon after he died, people in that region began praying to him. And you could find his image included among the images of other Cristero martyrs um, in central Mexico. Okay, so that's the Cristero War, and those are the martyrs of the Cristero War. But what does this have to do with migration? Well, Mexican migration really began picking up in the 1920s at the same time that the Cristero War was fought. And the most important sending region for Mexican migration was in the 1920s, the same West Central region, Jalisco, Guanajuato, Michoacán, Zacatecas, where the Cristero War happened. So both the same time and the same place. Um, and in fact, those states in Mexico, Jalisco, Guanajuato, Michoacán, are still the top sending states to this day. Still the majority of migrants who come from Mexico to the United States come from this region where the Cristero War was fought and where even though it's been forgotten in the United States and it's been forgotten even in Mexico to some extent, these people remember it and they remember the martyrs of the Cristero War. Um, and in the 1920s, people were migrating for many of the same reasons that they migrate today, for better jobs, for more money, but they were also migrating because they were exiles and refugees of this political and religious violence. And so when people came to the United States using the new train lines that had been developed that had led directly from West Central Mexico to cities like Los Angeles, San Antonio, El Paso, Chicago, Illinois, even a few to New York and Washington DC and Kansas. When people came to these new destinations in the United States, um, they formed communities of Mexicans who came from similar regions in Mexico and they quickly established organizations, um, newspapers, churches, they got together on the weekends and they lived together and they worked together and they talked about what was going on at home in Mexico. They, they were um, keeping close track of every development during the Cristero War. They knew about the martyrs who were, the new martyrs who were being um, made at home in Mexico. Um, and they began organizing in support of the Crucero War. Some of them, not all of them, and not all of them supported this Catholic cause, but some of them actually raised money to support the Crucero troops back home, participated in, uh, in political and religious uh, uh, marches and processions, and um, venerated those Mexican martyrs and taught their children to venerate them as well. And so um, this story of the way that migration overlapped with a political conflict in Mexico tells us something about, so tells us something new about Mexican migration in the 1920s, but also tells us something about even Mexican migration to this day. That Mexican migrants, like all migrants, leave home for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, sometimes in contemporary debates about Mexico and Mexican migration, um, Mexicans aren't spoken about as though they have, as though they're complex humans with political goals and religious devotions. Instead, we talk about building walls along the border and um, someone mentioned Donald Trump before, you know. Um, but I hope that what this story does is it helps us, reminds us that Mexican migrants have complex histories, that they have humanity, um, and that, that they, many of them also had a deep religious devotion that um, still persists to this day. So thank you very much, and thank you to the Library of Congress and the Kluge Center for inviting me.
Today was just a small sample of the diversity and richness of scholars who conduct residential research in the Library of Congress collections every day at the John W. Kluge Center. And so we hope you will uh, consider purchasing copies of these three scholars' books and also visiting our website at loc.gov slash kluge, K-L-U-G-E, to learn about other scholars conducting research at the library. We do have five minutes, a very tight, brief five minutes, for any questions to any of our three scholars. I will exit the stage. Please come to the microphone if you have a question, and then our scholar will stand up to answer your questions. Thank you. So you have five minutes to participate and you don't participate? We're, we're professors, we're gonna call on you. <laughs> well, how about I'll throw out a question for our scholars to address. If there are no other questions about the, uh, the author's uh, works, then maybe uh, Manuel can, uh, can rejoin us and uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the future of social movements uh, in the United States around the world as mobile and digital technology continues to evolve. The future is the present. Uh, this continues to evolve. As I said, um, in, in Europe particularly, the, the politics of austerity has been transformed by these social movements, totally unorganized, spontaneous, constructing their own networks, and when they go into politics, they go uh, forcefully. And in the United States, again, uh, although the Occupy movement, Occupy Wall Street, and did not have any political agenda. I, the only program that they created uh, in the General Assembly of, in New York uh, was a program with 385 different uh, proposals, including the dismantlement of all American bases uh, in, in the entire world. So I cannot say this is a program, but it was the expression of a huge movement to participate and change the way in which politics is conducted. Ultimately, all these movements, starting from very different ways, wanted to change the way politics is conducted. Well, politics is not changing. Uh, it's not changing. It's still media politics. It's still money buys presidents, money buys representatives. It's still there. But since we know that the minds had been transformed, not only by these movements, but by many other things. I think the future, the very immediate future, is a crisis of the political system that may have different expressions, not all positive in normative terms, in my view, but the work of an analyst, uh, which I am, I am also a committed citizen, but an analyst, is to understand what's happening. And the phenomenon of uh, populist, demagogy, racist, xenophobic, as Trump, can only be related to precisely this disgust of a segment of the electorate with professional politicians. And the same way in Europe, uh, I talk about these movements, which are the positive, um, progressive side of what has been happening, but most of the reactions against the traditional political class and the traditional institutions in Europe comes from the extreme right and comes also from xenophobia, um, and the, f the next, the, the top vote getter in the next presidential election may be a dignity of fascist leader, Marine Le Pen. Um, in uh, all over Scandinavia, xenophobic parties are coming to the parliament. Um, in Hungary, a fascist government is there uh, organizing the, the, the distress of refugees. In other words, the system, the political system around the world as it is, cannot continue. It will not continue. That's the future because it's the present. But the consequences of this inability of democracy to continue without reform are diverse and not always positive. Thank you. So with that, we do have to conclude. I hope please join me in thanking our three scholars again.
and we wish you much fun and enjoyment with the rest of your day. Thank you again. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.